and oxygen. So think of oxygen atoms, this is an artist's conception, right? With every other atom, a little less than every other atom, actually being something else. Like a magnesium atom, or a silicon atom, or an iron atom, you know, arrayed that way. But it's mostly oxygen. So, you know, those cartoons that maybe you didn't see, but your kids see, you know, with the wily animal running off the end of the cliff and running in space, that's pretty realistic. We're walking on oxygen, right? <laughs> So think of it that way, and you realize that all of a sudden, there's some very interesting phenomena we can think about in terms of the chemistry, the chemical properties and physical properties of oxygen at extreme conditions, especially when it comes into contact with a deep interior, the heart of steel. Again, most of it being liquid, only the innermost part being solid. And we know about this in considerable detail, as I mentioned, from seismology, which really fleshes out what we understand from samples at the surface of the Earth. Now, the seismologists, they're looking at the sound waves that are generated by earthquakes, large explosions, and as you'll see in a moment, other phenomena. And really, a seismologist is thinking of the Earth as something like a glass sculpture, looking at it with the light, that is the seismic or sound waves, being reflected and refracted by all of the different media inside the planet. And so really a seismologist is studying the interior as an as a object in optics, if you want. In fact, the same methods are used in ultrasonic imaging in medicine as are used in seismology and vice versa. And so basically we can determine quite a bit of detail of the interior from these methods. I want to mention another approach in seismology because it ties... ...than 12,000 times those at the surface. Then in 1958, everything changed. Scientists at the National Bureau of Standards announced that they had attained pressures 300,000 times that on the Earth's surface using a small tabletop device they called a diamond anvil cell. Over the next few years, improvements to the cell, many made at Carnegie's geophysical laboratory, brought even greater gains. This, this resulted over time in, uh, I've got to get to the next page. <laughs> in, it, the fact, in 1975, Carnegie's uh, Dave Mao and Peter Bell were the first to reach one million atmospheres of pressure. Today, scientists at Carnegie's Geophysical Lab and elsewhere routinely attain pressures exceeding those at the Earth's core. Many use these remarkable devices to discover the behavior of the materials forming the Earth's interior. Others, such as our guest tonight, Dr. Raymond jean Law, use diamond anvils and other devices to study the enormous temperatures and pressures of Jupiter, Saturn, and other giant planets. Dr. jean Law is a professor of Earth and Planetary Science and Astronomy at the University of California, Berkeley. After earning his bachelor's degree at Amherst College, uh, Raymond jean Law received his PhD at Caltech in 1979. He moved to UC Berkeley in 1982 after spending a few years as a member of the Harvard faculty. In addition to his roles as researcher and teacher, Dr. Jean Lowe also is a long-standing advisor to government and academia on areas of science and national security policy. In his current role as chair of the National Academy of Sciences Committee on International Security and Arms Control, he helps develop national and international counterterrorism and nuclear weapons policy. I have had the good fortune to work with him in this area. Dr. Jean Lowe has been a fellow of the American Academy of Arts and Sciences since 1992 and a member of the National Academy of Sciences since 2004. His awards include the 1984 James B. McElwain Medal of the American Geophysical Union, a 1988 MacArthur Fellowship, the 2008 Hans Bethe Award of the Federation of American Scientists, and the 2009 Leo Szilard Lectureship Award of the American Physical Society. As high-pressure researcher and diamond anvil pioneer, Dr. Jean Lowe has long been acquainted with the Carnegie Institution. Tonight, we are honored to welcome him back as he tells us about the high pressure and high temperature conditions under which planets form and evolve. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Raymond jean -Lo. I dropped the forward. I hope it's 
of you. <laughs> Thank you so much. It's a terrific pleasure to be here with many friends, colleagues. I know some of you are far removed from the sciences. I especially appreciate your coming out in the evening when there are many other things to do in this town. But again, coming to Carnegie Institution of Washington, truly one of the great scientific institutions in the world, is a special privilege for me. Let me start right away in the spirit of being in this town by asking the question that any taxpayer might ask, why did we go to the moon? And there are many answers to that. But now as scientists, or as non-scientists, you might ask our scientists, what did we really get out of that $20 billion that was spent in the Apollo mission? And that was at a time when $20 billion was really worth quite a bit more than it now is. <laughs> well, one thing is purely the impression of you know, the low gravitational force on the moon as you see the astronauts with their heavy packs moving around. And there were a number of scientific discoveries or confirmations. The age of the moon was determined and so on. But I think there's no question that the single biggest breakthrough And that was really a surprise, completely unexpected, more amazing than fiction itself. The idea, really the conclusion, and currently our best theory for the formation of the Earth, I'm sorry, the formation of the Earth-Moon system was that the Moon was splashed out of the Earth, as shown in this computer simulation. And in fact, that came out of observations that had been around for quite a while. For example, that the moon is a very massive object, heavy object, that's at some considerable distance from the Earth. And so it's actually very, very difficult to capture the moon in its orbit. In fact, if one takes the currently measured orbit of the moon, we see that it's receding from the Earth. And you can backtrack that orbit to a time in geological history when the moon was long, long ago, billions of years ago, essentially on top of the Earth. But some of the details of the rocks that were brought back in the Apollo mission really were intriguing in convincing us that there is a profound similarity between the material in the moon and the material inside the Earth. And in fact, the conclusion that the moon was completely molten four and a half billion years ago I can give you a flavor for how that conclusion was reached. You know the moon has the white highlands rocks and the darker maria, the basaltic rocks. And the geochemists who studied these two different kinds of rocks found that they really fit like hand in glove together, as though they were once part of uh, an entire system of a whole planet that then got separated out by a melting process. Problem was, no one could figure out how do you melt an entire planet? Radioactivity is way too slow to do that. Until along came one of our colleagues, one of your colleagues, George Wetherill, who had been doing computer simulations of how dust and mineral grains and small rocks accumulate around the new sun, the solar nebula around our new star. And what he said was, I can do this in a computer. I can calculate the force between the particles, between millions, hundreds of millions of these particles. And what I find is that when the particles come together, they make little clumps. That makes sense. And then those clumps come together and make bigger clumps and bigger clumps. And so he discovered sort of a hierarchy of the way gravity works, purely through computer simulations. In the end, though, comes a surprising conclusion with clumping together when planets are at their final sizes, with clumping together are objects of comparable size. In the final stages of formation of planets, it's actually planetary size objects that are splashing into each other. And so that provided for the first time a mechanism for melting wholesale the planet. And in fact, the computer simulations suggest that the Earth was effectively blown apart through a glancing blow. We think an object maybe the size of Mars or so, half the diameter of the Earth, but was blown apart, but not sufficiently to disperse the material completely, but the material reaccumulated to form the Earth. A little lump of it formed the moon on the side. And many, many lines of evidence now support this. This has become something of a theme in planetary science. Late in the formation of planets, the late stage, these giant impacts, 
The moon got splashed out of the Earth. Uh, just in passing, I'll mention that another totally mysterious observation that had been known about for a long time, the planet Mercury sitting next to the sun, has a very thin veneer of rock around its metallic core, unlike the Earth and Venus and Mars that have a thick veneer. Again, if there was a late-stage giant impact, in the case of Mercury, it's different because now that material is blasted apart. It's sitting next to the sun with its enormous gravitational attraction that sucks in a lot of that rock. And so it provides a natural explanation for that thin veneer. So I can give you a rule of thumb if you'd like to get an idea of the conditions that are generated. The impact velocity, if it's expressed in kilometers per second, Think of this as an orbital velocity as maybe some poor object wanders into the orbit to be intersected by a planet that's orbiting around the sun or some other star. Typical orbital velocities are tens of kilometers per second, tens of thousands of miles per hour. You take that orbital velocity or impact velocity divided by 10 and square the number. It'll give you the pressure in millions of atmospheres. It's a little rule of thumb. And what you come up with are pressures of tens of millions of atmospheres in planetary impacts. And in fact, um, 15, 16 years ago, we were privileged for the first time to actually observe a planetary scale impact when comet Shoemaker-Levy had wandered a little too close to the orbit of Jupiter and then was drawn back in to implode or collide with Jupiter, um, causing the spectacular display in the summer of 1994 at very high impact velocities and creating very high pressures. So we're very motivated in the planetary sciences to understand these kinds of pressures and the conditions that arise associated with the formation of planets, but also, as Dr. Mazur pointed out, with the interior of planets. And he already let the cat out of the bag. I'll just remind you. The pressure deep inside the Earth, we know what it is because we know something about the density as a function of depth in the Earth. I'll remind you in a few moments how we know that. Near the surface of the Earth, we have water and then the density of rock, which is two, three times that, the density of water. And then as we go down, actually from a geophysicist's point of view, you might argue that the main surface of the Earth is not the one where we humans happen to live right here, but really the interface between rock and steel, between the mantle of the core and the uh, mantle of the Earth and the core of the Earth, where there's an enormous increase in density and all the physical properties change enormously at that depth. And that's at a depth corresponding to pressures of a bit more than a million times atmospheric pressure. The center of the Earth, the pressures are about three and a half, 3.6 million times atmospheric pressure. And we can study materials at these conditions very much because of the work that was pioneered here at the Carnegie Institution of Washington um, and followed up all around the world. But there's a more profound reason, and many in this audience know this, a more profound reason for studying materials at these pressures, and that's because when we squeeze atoms at these conditions, we're really, really, really pressurizing them. Well, what do I mean by that? We're changing the properties. The compressional energies associated with million atmosphere pressures are comparable to the chemical bonding energies or the energies of the outer electrons of the atoms. And I couldn't resist putting in the first pictures, to my knowledge at least, of the outer bonding electrons. This happens to be for carbon. And we see these are real pictures taken uh, in the Ukraine, fantastic experiments published less than a year ago, showing the different distribution of electrons, the fuzz around the atoms that provide the bindings between the atoms to give us the compounds, the materials that we know about. In fact, that bind the atoms and molecules to form us. So these are real images of the so-called S electrons and P electrons. In any case, the energies involved with these kinds of pressures, the, the work that's done, responds in a physicist units to electron volts. But maybe one way to think about it is we, if we convert that energy to temperature, it's of the order of, a, of tens of thousands of degrees Fahrenheit. And so these are really quite extreme conditions that exist inside our own planet, day in and day out. So of course, to reproduce these conditions, one of the tools that's been developed over the years is the diamond anvil cell, as done here at the Geophysical Laboratory. And the method is actually very simple in principle. You know that pressure is 
force per unit area. And so if you make the tip of two diamonds very, very small, the area, the surface area with which you squeeze a sample is very tiny. And so even with fairly modest forces, you can get to these enormous pressures. So we use diamond because it's the strongest material known. But more important than that, as you well know, diamond's transparent. We can look through these diamond windows and really study the material in situ, in place. And we do that using visible light. We can look through a microscope down on a sample that's, in this particular case, at a few hundred thousand times atmospheric pressure. Notice the distances are quite small. We can send x-rays into the, uh, through the diamond anvils and probe the sample material. Uh, we can actually send laser beams, heat the sample material to white hot temperatures, melting that material. That's interesting because the heart of steel of our Earth, most of it is liquid, the core of the Earth. Most of it is liquid metal, uh, liquid iron alloy or liquid steel in common parlance. And so we can reproduce those conditions of very high pressures and temperatures in the diamond anvil cell and try and understand our planet's interior. And I'll come back to some of these images, but this shows some dramatic changes in the chemical properties of materials. So I have to step back for just a moment and remind you about what we know about the interior of our planet. And I want to put this in perspective, first of all, by reminding you of the distances involved. From here to the center of the Earth is roughly the distance from Washington, D.C. to Geneva. And sometimes people ask me, well, can we just drill? You know, we're high tech. <laughs> and just as a you know, perspective, and many of you laugh, so you, you can imagine this, I believe the deepest drill core went to nearly the distance of the outermost reaches of the metro, okay? <laughs> and at that point, it's not like you run out of gas or juice. You know, we, we've got the energy to drill deeper. The problem is the rock is under such pressure that you've got the hole, it's being drilled out, and it's collapsing on itself. So you end up just re-drilling, you know, the same spot, and you don't get any farther. Of course, there are high temperatures and so on. So there's no way we're going to get there by drilling, but... We use sound waves to study the deep interior, the science of seismology. And sometimes also geology or volcanology helps us in that fragments of rock are ejected out of the Earth's interior, sometimes from depths of as much as several hundred miles. You might ask, how do you know that? And the aficionados in this room know the answer because some of those fragments contain our favorite mineral, which is diamond, yes. <laughs> the high pressure form of carbon requires 50,000 times atmospheric pressure roughly to form at high pressures. And so diamond is a marker of a rock having come from great depth. And in fact, that gives us an indication that rocks come from at least that deep, maybe even a little bit deeper. So we have some samples. We know the outer part of the Earth is made of rock. Well, for chemists, that's oxides. Really, for most of us, we should think of it as oxygen. Rock is more than 50% oxygen. So think of oxygen atoms. This is an artist conception, right? With every other atom, a little less than every other atom, actually being something else. Maybe a magnesium atom, or a silicon atom, or an iron atom, you know, arrayed that way. But it's mostly oxygen. So, you know, those cartoons that maybe you didn't see, but your kids see, you know, with the wily animal running off the end of the cliff and running in space, that's pretty realistic. We're walking on oxygen, right? <laughs> So think of it that way, and you realize that all of a sudden, there's some very interesting phenomena we can think about in terms of the chemistry, the chemical properties and physical properties of oxygen at extreme conditions, especially when it comes into contact with a deep interior, the heart of steel. Again, most of it being liquid, only the innermost part being solid. And we know about this in considerable detail, as I mentioned, from seismology, which really fleshes out what we understand from samples at the surface of the Earth. Now, to seismologists, they're looking at the sound waves that are generated by earthquakes, large explosions, and as you'll see in a moment, other phenomena. And really, a seismologist is thinking of the Earth as something like a glass sculpture, looking at it with the light, that is the seismic or sound waves, being reflected and refracted by all of the different media inside the planet. And so really a seismologist is studying the interior as an as a object in optics, if you want. In fact, the same methods are used in ultrasonic imaging in medicine as are used in seismology and vice versa. And so basically we can determine quite a bit of detail of the interior from these methods. 
I want to mention another approach in seismology because it ties back to some of the other themes that we'll be talking about. After major earthquakes, the entire planet oscillates. It resonates. It hums. Okay, there's a mode of oscillation, which is the entire planet breathing. It takes about 20 minutes. There's another mode, so-called football mode. Planet expands its weight, contracts that way, and the other way around, okay? Can't do it. Something like that. You get, that takes about an hour for the planet to do that. Also, there are torsional oscillations. These are overtones, harmonics, like from a symphony orchestra, okay? And the basses at low frequencies on our piano scale here tell us something about the deep interior, the core of the Earth, and so on. And the piccolos and the woodwinds at higher frequencies tell us about the shallower region, the crust of the Earth. So seismologists, well, I thought of them as sculptors, but they're actually also musicians. They tie this together and very much by listening, well, by mathematically processing all of the data for the overtones. And hundreds of these overtones have been measured. They can tell us exquisite detail about the Earth's interior. So that's the raw data that we use. But as a tiny digression, I can't help but mention this amazing result of the past handful of years. Typical scientists, you know, I can measure the resonances. This was after that devastating earthquake, well, it was a particularly devastating tsunami caused by this earthquake in Sumatra a few years ago. Sure, there were great overtones measured then, but someone had the idea of let's measure what's going on in between the earthquakes when nothing's happening. And you'd say, it's just noise. And that's what seismologists said for years until they actually did it. And in between the earthquakes, the scale is tilted here as a function of time, 1989, 1990, 1991. These are the overtones and harmonics of the planet when there are no earthquakes. They've cut out all of the earthquake dynamics in here. So the planet is actually humming along at all times. And if you want to know why that is, it's still an area of study, but basically it looks like the reason has to do with the surf. It's the booming surf. It's ocean interaction with the land, also air to some degree. So we live on a humming planet that's sort of like a, uh, an aeolian harp, I suppose. And this has really been a fantastic development in seismology to realize we don't need earthquakes, okay? including this remarkable paper a couple of years ago by my San Diego colleagues, when Katrina hit California. So when Katrina hit New Orleans, the woomph of the entire continent was recorded on the West Coast. And in fact, these colleagues now are using ocean storms as sources of seismic energy to help us illuminate the interior of the planet. So great developments. So we turn to this and figure, okay, they're giving us all this great data. Let's actually simulate the conditions of the deep interior and see how much the chemistry really changes. And so we've done that over the years, we and many others, and we know something about what happens when you put rock against metal. At least at low pressures, we know that. The steel industry knows all about it. Um, when you have a contamination of ceramic or oxide rocky material in the liquid steel, it's called slag. They scoop it off, okay? And at low pressures, in fact, Steel and rock are like oil and water. They don't interact. They're chemically very, very distinct. And we even see this in natural samples of liquid steel and rock now solidified in these wonderful palisite meteorites, which are core metal boundaries from very small objects, asteroids that never got to high pressures. And we can see that the steel and the rock don't mix. So when we put them together, the oxide rocky material with the steel, before heating, nothing's going on. But when we heat with a laser beam and melt the metal, we get chemical reaction zones. We can study this. And many people, there's sort of a cottage industry of studying these chemical reactions that happen at high pressures, not at low pressures. So all of a sudden, the chemical bonding really has changed. And that reminds me of this picture, which is a couple of my colleagues from France published last year, this beautiful photograph of oxygen, normally a transparent gas. When you put it into a diamond anvil cell and squeeze it, it becomes a crystalline solid. And you squeeze it some more, it turns colors. It actually becomes red, orange red. Finally, it becomes opaque and looks like a metal. Okay. This is like silverware, at least like the small amount of silverware we have tarnished. Okay. It's like a tarnished metal. It's reflective, but you can definitely see that. This is, by the way, the surrounding steel reflectivity out here. And it's actually a pretty amazing metal. So, 
given that rock is mostly oxygen, and oxygen already is at a, a metal at a million atmospheres, it sort of makes sense that there's this kind of combining, chemical combining. So the chemistry is totally different. And if you go to the periodic table and look at the right-hand side, you'll be reminded that oxygen is right above sulfur. And actually, sulfur forms compounds with ions, like fool's gold, pyrite. OK, that's a nice metal. Nice, shiny. It's fooled a lot of people, right? 